medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk today about an interesting study that looked at the use of near-infrared light in mice that were fed to induce neuroinflammation similar to what they see in obesity. And this is basically a model for inflammation that we see in human brains. And there's been a lot of evidence up to this point that obesity can cause neuroinflammation and may be a driver in humans for dementia. And what they aimed to do in this study was to show that near-infrared radiation can actually reverse some of the surrogates of inflammation that they see in the brains of these mice. And this has bigger implications. The whole purpose of this video is to sort of illuminate, if you will, the purpose of sunlight and near-infrared radiation. So let's take a look at this study because I think it goes along with what we've been talking about before with how light can affect the human body. There's another name for this called photobiomodulation, which has actually been around for a long time. And we're going to look at this study that was published this year. It's got some pretty interesting things. So again, to remind you, we're looking at near-infrared radiation, which is in this spectrum here from 760 nanometers to 1400 nanometers, which is not visible and just beyond the red. Near-infrared is what is used here. Specifically in this case, they're actually looking at something just on the visible side of this at 670 nanometers. But you can see here that the solar spectrum also goes into the ultraviolet as well as infrared. And of course, you get this visible light spectrum here in the middle. So what they did was they took male mice that were five weeks old and they randomized them to receive two types of diets. The control diet was actually regular chow. And we'll abbreviate that as RC. And the other type of diet was a high fat diet, HFD. And there were 10 in each group. So let's take a look at the diet specifically. Here we see the regular chow, and here we see the high fat diet. Now notice the difference. Notice that the protein is almost identical between these two types of diet. But there's a huge difference in fat. I mean, 60% versus 5.8%. So obviously, high-fat diet is well-named. This is a high-fat diet. And look at the uh, regular diet. 44% are carbohydrates, whereas in the high-fat diet, only 20% are carbohydrates. And of course, because there's such a high-fat diet here, the energy density is just much higher in the high-fat diet. And in terms of the fat composition, so what types of fat are we talking about? You can see here how much of the palmitic, the steric, the oleic, the linoleic, and the linolenic acids there are. And you can just see here, I mean, the majority much higher in the omega-9, omega-6, but also increased in the steric and the palmitic as well. So total saturated fat went from 0.8 all the way to 32.2. Total monosaturated went from 1.3 to 35.9, and total polyunsaturated went from 2.9 to 31.9. So really, across the board, an increase in the fat composition in this diet, in this HFD. So after they randomized them, they fed them for 13 weeks. Then, as they continued to feed them on these two types of diets, they further randomized the RC groups and the HFD groups, or the high fat diet groups, into further randomization. And what they did was they exposed them to a infrared laser. Let's talk about that intervention. So they did this laser one time per day for 90 seconds. They did it of five to seven days of the week, so not on the weekends. And the intensity was about four joules per square centimeter and they held the mouse about one centimeter from the light source. And what they did is they did a randomization. So they did a sham infrared and they did a real infrared. So they did exactly the same thing to both sets of mice. And so in this case, they did the sham and they did the infrared laser. They did the sham and they did the infrared laser. And this is on the skull, basically. So it penetrates through the skull into the brain where this inflammation is potentially occurring with the high fat diet. And so this group is known as the regular chow sham. This group is known as the regular chow near infrared. This one is known as the high fat diet sham. And this was known as the high fat diet near infrared. 
So we have those that got fed a regular diet and did not get near infrared. We had those that got a regular diet and did get near infrared. We have those that got fed a high fat diet and did not get near infrared, and those that got a high fat diet and got a near infrared. And there was about five here in each category. So let's take a look at the results. Let's see what happened. We're looking at something called CD68, which is a marker for inflammation. As you can see here, when we look at the regular chow and compare it to the high fat diet, there is a statistically significant increase in the amount of CD68 just going from the regular chow to the high fat diet. But when we introduce the near infrared radiation in those mice that have the high fat diet, there is a statistically significant reduction in CD68 as a surrogate for inflammation, indicating that near infrared radiation can reverse some of the inflammatory aspects of a high fat diet. Interesting here when we look at GFAP, which stands for glial fibrillar acidic protein, we see something very similar as well. We see that when we compare to regular chow, the high fat diet, statistically significant increase in GFAP, there's a statistical reduction in the amount of GFAP when we have near infrared radiation. When we look at other markers here in the hippocampus, for instance, tumor necrosis factor alpha, Again, with the high fat diet, there is a statistical increase in tumor necrosis factor alpha and a reduction when we use near infrared radiation. And we can see similar cases here when we look at the other markers like interleukin 1 beta and IL 10. What's interesting on this last one is this brain-derived neurotrophic factor is actually high levels are actually good in this case because BDNF is responsible for supporting the neurons. And we see here that in a high-fat diet, we see a reduction in this good BDNF. But when we expose the cells to near-infrared radiation, despite the fact that they're on a high-fat diet, what we see is an increase in BDNF. So before we get too excited, remember that this is an animal study, it's mice. But the nice thing about mice is that you can actually study them and randomize them and do everything you need to because they're in a laboratory. Remember, however, that we're not looking at endpoints of diagnosis of dementia. We're not looking at outcomes. We're not looking at mental exams. We're looking at surrogates. So we have to have a little bit of caution there. But it's interesting that this fits very nicely into what we've been talking about before, being outside and exposed to sunlight, which has a component of near-infrared radiation. In our video, Light as Medicine, we talk about the mitochondria. The mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, which makes ATP. And in the process, just like an engine generates heat, the mitochondria generates oxidative stress. Well, that oxidative stress is dealt with in two different ways. It's dealt with because problems with the mitochondria can lead to less optimal health like inflammation, as we've seen in this study, cancer, dementia, diabetes, and even learning disabilities. And the body has a way of taking care of that in the form of melatonin. Now, we've talked about this in Light as Medicine, and we showed that at night, the pineal gland secretes melatonin so long as there's not light stimulating the retina and shutting down melatonin production but also in the day that melatonin through near-infrared radiation, it is proposed, stimulates the production of melatonin. Now there's some interesting aspects of this. Not all of the dots have been connected, but there are some papers out there that are highly suggestive, if you connect the dots, that near-infrared radiation is what is stimulating the melatonin. Now this is a paper titled, Investigating Ecrine Sweat as a Non-Invasive Biomarker Resource. These were males less than the age of 22 that were exercising out in Arizona. And as you can see here, with the blue bars, which are the concentration of melatonin in the sweat, and the orange bars, which is the concentration of melatonin in the serum, what you can see here are levels that well exceed the levels that you would see in the serum at night, which is around 60 picograms per milliliter, or during the day at 10 picograms per milliliter. And in some cases, you can see here that the concentration of melatonin in the sweat actually exceeded the concentration in the serum. So the remarkable thing here is, number one, that we're seeing levels far above regular levels in the serum during exercise. And these are exercising outside, particularly. 
And we're also seeing that in some cases, the amount of melatonin in the sweat exceeds that of the amount in the serum. Now that is highly suggestive of local production of melatonin in response to exercising outside. And it's because of this data that this review that was authored by Scott Zimmerman and Russell Ryder basically get into the understanding that melatonin is the hormone not only of night, but of the day in the mitochondria that battle this oxidative stress. And there are a number of other papers that get into this idea that melatonin in the mitochondria is mitigating clear and present dangers of oxidative stress. In fact, in the paper which we cite, they state, it has now been shown that the mitochondria produce melatonin in many cells in quantities which are orders of magnitude higher than that produced in the pineal gland. This subcellular melatonin does not necessarily fluctuate with our circadian clock or release into the circulation system, but instead has been proposed to be consumed locally in response to the free radical density within each cell, in particular in response to near-infrared exposure. And so when we see melatonin being secreted in the sweat, we have to understand that near-infrared radiation penetrates deeply into the subcutaneous tissue in the mitochondria and can produce the types of melatonin potentially that we see. Now, in terms of this study that we talked about where near-infrared lasers were used to penetrate the skull, the question may be brought up, how well is it that near-infrared radiation from the sun can penetrate into the brain and cause the same sort of effect? And that's exactly what is proposed in the paper that was published in Melatonin Research. They're saying that sunlight, and specifically near-infrared light, can penetrate the skull, actually gets diffused into the cerebral spinal fluid, and is absorbed into these sulci that can be absorbed into the mitochondria, specifically the gray matter, which is here at the surface of the brain where it is needed. And I thought that this was kind of far-fetched until I realized that we know that light can penetrate the skull and the bone of the skull because we actually use it in our physical diagnosis to illuminate the frontal and maxillary sinuses. As you can see here, this light is shining on the frontal sinus, and we can see that the frontal sinus is illuminating, which tells us that the frontal sinus is open. You can see here the frontal sinus in this area is an open area that can illuminate. The other thing that we can do is shine a light here on the maxillary area of the skull and we can see inside the mouth light illuminating from the maxilla. And that's essentially what we're doing here is we are illuminating with light here. The light is penetrating through the bone and we're able to see it in the mouth. So yes, light actually can penetrate through the skull. And then to remind some of you, you don't need direct exposure to the sun to get near-infrared radiation. In fact, as you can see here, that near-infrared radiation tends to bounce very nicely off of things that are green, like grass, trees, and leaves. And this also goes along with something that we've known for a long time, that being in the great outdoors confers health benefits. From this article, quote, we found that spending time in or living close to natural green spaces is associated with diverse and significant health benefits. It reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, premature death, preterm birth, increases sleep duration. People living closer to nature also had reduced diastolic blood pressure, heart rates, and stress. In fact, one of the really interesting things we found is that exposure to green space significantly reduces people's levels of salivary cortisol, a physiological marker of stress. It's interesting that they point this out because there was a study that was done in Europe looking at blood tests that were obtained in two cities, in the Netherlands and also in Oxfordshire, UK. And what they did is they looked at the previous seven days before the blood was turned into the lab and they looked at the number of days of sunshine. And wouldn't you know it, when they did the study, those people who had more days of sunlight prior to turning in their blood for testing had better glucose metabolism scores, had better lipid metabolism scores, including HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. This is not new. We also have a study here from southern Sweden looking at 30,000 women selected at random and looking at over 2,500 deaths over a span of 20 years. And they asked about multiple ways that they spent in the sun, whether it was sunbathing, tanning, salons, etc. They found that those people who had the most sun exposure had the highest mean survival. And those people that had the most sun avoiding behavior had the lowest mean survival. But wait, there's more. 
actually, when we look at multiple sclerosis, and we know that people who live in higher latitudes have an increased risk for multiple sclerosis, and we looked at controls, no matter which one you looked at, those people in the highest quartile of sun exposure had the largest gray matter volume and had the largest whole brain volume. And so to summarize, we've known for a long time that people who are exposed to outdoor light more often are healthier in many different ways. What we're now starting to realize is exactly how that is coming about. What is the physiology for that? And I think that's important because if we look over time, the amount of near-infrared radiation that we're being exposed to in the last 200 years is dramatically dropping. And it's dropping because we're using different types of bulbs, because we are putting in different types of glass that may block near-infrared radiation, and also because we're no longer spending 50% of our lives outdoors. It's more like we're spending only about 7% of our lives outdoors. And so if you're worried about diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or learning disabilities or oxidative stress, my advice would be to get outside more often and get into the sunlight. And if you found this interesting and want to know more, we at MedCram have teamed up with the people at Commune and put together, absolutely free, a one-hour masterclass titled Nine Secrets to a Strong Immune System. We'll put the link to this in the description below. Don't forget to also join us at medcram.com.